thank you. Um, so thank you for giving me the opportunity. I'm happy that I can present my work. And uh, as, he, as you said, I'm Guillem Domenech. I'm a yeah, Fellini Fellow at Padova. So this means I have to acknowledge um, I received support from ENFN and the European Union. And so today I like to discuss and show you various possible gravitational wave signals uh, that are sourced by uh, primordial fluctuations. Um, my talk will be kind of an overview of the different possibilities. Uh, if you want to see more details, uh, you can check my review paper, or if you have questions, you can send me an email. All right, so, so let's start uh, with some rough illustration I drew some, yeah, some time ago. Um, this tries to show you um, the, the rough evolution of the early universe, infer from what we, we have observed and explored, which I illustrated these re green regions, and also some periods that we don't know very well, which are I show in, in blue. And so time flows uh, to the right. And so let me start from the beginning. We don't know how, how the universe started, but we have strong evidence that there was a period of inflation where quantum fluctuations that just get stretched and these quantum fluctuations become um, the primordial fluctuations. Then somehow inflation ends um, and we reach the, um, the standard Big Bang cosmology. So the universe is filled with radiation. And from roughly one second after the Big Bang or roughly the time of neutrino decoupling, we know um, pretty well what happened. We had Big Bang nucleosynthesis. And then at some point, the photons decoupled, and this is what we see as CMB photons. And the CMB anisotropies that tells us about some, you know, some few falls, the first few falls of inflation. Now, how can we get to know anything about this unknown uh, period if electromagnetic waves um, can only travel so far? So luckily, now we can maybe in the future test it with gravitational waves since they travel barely scattered by matter. And hopefully we could test um, this period here, which I call reheating, but um, yeah, the generic name can be anything. And here I draw some, some possibility, and is that primordial fluctuations that enter the horizon in this regime, they generate uh, gravitational waves and maybe primordial black holes. These are not the only um, possibilities. You could have new physics during inflation, for example, some tensor modes, tensor fluctuations during inflation, or SG2 gauge fields or axiom fields that source tensor modes that later become the gravitational waves. Um, you could also have something new after inflation, like strong or first order phase transitions or cosmic strings, resonances during reheating. Um, but I will be mainly interested on this um, gravitational wave from primordial fluctuations. Since um, we have we have seen these uh, primordial fluctuations in the CMB in the larger scales at least, so in the in the future we might have something like this. Hopefully, um, here in the vertical axis you have uh, spectral density of gravitational waves versus frequency, and I show some prototype of uh, gravitational wave spectra: cosmic strings, first order phase transitions in these gravitational waves and also some of the sensitivity curve of pulsar timing, LISA, the SIGO, and LIGO. But uh, what I want to emphasize with this, this figure is that if you take a, a given frequency and then you, you compute what is the, the scale of the horizon corresponding to, to this frequency and compute the temperature at that time, then you will find that for 10 to the minus nine Hertz, the universe was at 100 MeV, and for 200 Hertz, which is LIGO and ET band, um, is 10 to the 10 GeV. So with gravitational wave, we are probing a, a big chunk of this unknown uh, early universe. Now I have to say um, this relation and this spectrum um, have been have been assumed to be derived in uh, radiation domination. 
So these, these things will change a little bit if you change the, the expansion history of this unknown early universe. So this is how my, my talk will go. First, I would like to give you some brief review of how these induced gravitational waves are generated. And I will do so in the minimal case, which is assuming radiation dominated um, cosmology. But then I will go beyond that standard cosmology and talk about what is the impact of having a different expansion history, so different equation of state. And for in this case, I will focus on adiabatic initial conditions. But then I would like to consider also what happens if um, the initial conditions have some different nature. So if they are um, isocurvature fluctuations. Um, my talk is based in several papers I did in the past uh, two years. And if you want to know more details, please yeah, have a look. So let me start with this brief review and let me give some quick credit to the first um, one to notice this effect, which was uh, Japanese, Kenji Tomita, a long time ago. And then it was rediscovered by Matarese in uh, the 90s. And there was some nice work by people in Portsmouth and uh, Bauman. And it wasn't until 2008 that Saito and Yokoyama made uh, the connection between uh, induced gravitational waves and primordial black holes. And then since LIGO detected uh, the first merger of uh, black holes, then there are a lot of papers. Um, but if you want to, to see the history in more detail, uh, I invite you to check, check my paper. Now let's have a look in a little bit more rigorous um, sense what, what is happening. Um, if you look at this diagram, um, in the vertical axis, you have physical scale, for example, the current Hebel radius. And in the horizontal axis, you have a logarithm of the scale factor or EFOLS. You can see in green, this is uh, supposed to be inflation. Then in red is radiation domination, in blue, the late matter domination. And with the CMB observations, we can, um, well, we know that the the primordial spectrum in the first, generating the first few efforts of inflation was almost scale invariant. So we know more or less what happened here, but we don't know what happens afterwards. And it, it is a possibility that there is some non-trivial um, inflationary dynamics, like some sudden turns or some ultra slow roll phase, or whatever you can think of that enhances um, primordial fluctuations with respect to the CMB amplitude. After this enhancement, things happen as usual. These fluctuations are frozen until they re-enter the horizon and interesting things happen again. Um, maybe gravitational waves and primordial black holes. So let's have a look a little bit what happens here in some another drawing. Um, for simplicity, um, just take a sharp peak in the power spectrum. Um, this means you have some um, fluctuations on a given scale, particular scale K star with um, the, the amplitude of these density fluctuations are the, uh, that I am um, drawn from a, a Gaussian with variance, the amplitude of the peak. So this is what it means. And initially these fluctuations are much larger than the horizon. Um, so they are frozen, they don't evolve, but eventually um, the horizon catches up and the fluctuations start to evolve. And here two things will happen or might happen. So the first one is if you look at one um, Hubble patch, and if in this Hubble patch, the density fluctuations are over some threshold, and then they will collapse under their own gravity and form a primordial black holes. And the mass of the black hole, you can relate it to uh, being proportional to the mass enclosed inside the horizon, which is proportional to the scale of the fluctuation. In this way, you have an estimate for the mass of the primordial black hole. But so if you look, uh, not only a single part with a large density, but what happens uh, on average is that you will have um, these density fluctuations will start to create um, sound waves in the fluid. They will start to oscillate. And this oscillation will create space-time oscillations and so induce gravitational waves. And this gravitational wave has a typical frequency, a typical peak frequency. Um, proportional to the, the typical scale of the fluctuation. 
So by this simple um, estimate, you can relate the frequency of the gravitational waves with the mass of the primordial black holes. And if you do that, um, you get something like this. This is a diagram trying to show the connection between the primordial black holes on top and the gravitational waves in the bottom. So on top, I show, um, for example, interesting mass ranges like 10 to 100 solar masses, which uh, fall into the LIGO, Virgo range. Then you could have also planet mass, primordial black holes. You could explain this way some micro lensing events seen by Ogle. Or maybe in the asteroid mass range, you could be a uh, primordial black hole could be 100% of dark matter. Now, if you assume radiation domination, you get this nice relation here. So you can connect um, these primordial black hole scenarios with um, some frequency ranges of detectors and future, the future and current detectors. So for example, um, for 100 solar masses, you fall into the pulsar timing array band, where there is um, a possibility of a gravitational background. Um, so this is interesting. And also you have maybe two populations of black holes in the, the LIGO catalog. So this is an interesting uh, possibility. Um, but all, all this connection depends on the unknown um, early universe cosmology. For example, if you, con you focus on this um, possible background seen by the pulsar timing, if the universe was dominated by some early matter phase, then I, I have shown with the Shippy that it could explain the planet mass um, primordial black hole since Biogal. So the, all, all this connection in the end depend on the unknown early universe cosmology. So this, this has a strong, strong impact. So let's see um, what is the impact of this um, early universe cosmology. But before that, let's have just a very quick estimate of the amplitude of, of gravitational waves. Um, I will go a bit quickly over this, but I hope it's clear. So at first order, you have free waves, free gravitational waves propagating in the universe. At second order in cosmological perturbation, you will have some source, and this source will be proportional to the square of the curvature perturbation. So the power spectrum of gravitational waves will be proportional to the power spectrum square of the scalar fluctuations times some redshift factor and if you put some numbers, it is 10 to minus six, uh, the power spectrum square. With some more uh, graphical intuition about the, the detectability of these induced gravitational waves, I show here spectral density of gravitational wave versus frequency and some um, sensitivity curve, the power law integrated sensitivity curves. If you take the primordial spectrum to be Larger than 10 to minus 4 is this line here. You will see them in the cycle. And if they are larger than 10 to minus 2, you should see them almost everywhere. And furthermore, have a detectable primordial black hole counterpart. But this has been um, assuming um, radiation domination. So what, let's see what happens um, if we change the early universe expansion history. Um, if you have any questions, uh, before that, I can stop. If not, I will move on. Okay. Um, so let's let's look again at the, the equation of motion for the these induced tensor modes, and you can clearly see the effect of the expansion history in the, the Hubble friction here, the, the expansion history H. But there will be also another effect by a different evolution of the scalar fluctuations. Okay, this, this will have a non-trivial impact. And then there's another effect, which is that um, scalar fluctuations uh, might propagate um, with the, the, the speed different than light. For example, for radiation, you have that um, um, Cs is one over square root of three. And if this happens, then there will be some interesting resonances. This is because if you see the, this equation, you have an normalic oscillator with a periodic source. And so if the frequency of the oscillator matches the one of the periodic force, and then you will have, you expect some resonances. So let's see all this with some simple examples. 
Uh, the first simple example, I guess to me, the simplest one is the broken power law. It's not the direct delta. And I say it's the simplest because if you take um, power law, broken power law, primordial spectrum, and you get a broken power law induced gravitational wave spectrum. So here you see the logarithm of the primordial spectrum um, versus wave number at some peak, and then you have an infrared tail with some spectral index and some UV tail with another spectral index and UV. The infrared spectral index is often not much bigger than four, and this is what happens in single field inflation models. And the UV tilt is directly related to the second degree of the inflation potential. Yeah. Hello? Yep. Okay. Uh, so this NUV is um, proportional to the second derivative of the inflaton potential, which can be related to, to local non-Gaussianity. This is something we discussed with Vicente. And then if you compute the induced gravitational wave signal, you have again a broken power law. The infrared always goes k to the cube. This has been shown by Kai P and Sasaki, this universal infrared slope. And the UV is related to the, the primordial spectrum UV, um, depending on the value is two times the, the NUV or four plus NUV. So if you see the, the UV tail, then you can get information on, on FNL or the second derivative of inflaton potential. Now what happens if we do not assume radiation? So we assume that the, the universe was dominated by some perfect fluid with a constant equation of state, different than one third. So this is what you get. Now this time you get a double um, broken power law. And the change in the slope is uh, related to this parameter B, which is related to the equation of state. It's zero for radiation and negative it's if you have, um, of W is greater than one and positive is less than one third, greater than one third and less than one third. Here you have an additional scale, which is the reheating scale, which after that you get into radiation domination. So that's why you keep the universal infrared tail here. But then you have a mid infrared slope, which goes as three to the minus two B and the UV slope also change. So now the question is, if you only see the UV tail, you cannot um, directly relate it to the, uh, the primordial spectrum unless you know the, the expansion history. Uh, you might hope to the, disentangle everything if you, you see the whole spectrum. So this is one effect. Now let me show you another effect with uh, the Senko, second simplest example, which is a, a very sharp peak in the primordial spectrum. Um, I will take for simplicity, a direct delta with a pre-tooth capital A. And I show you two cases here. One is that the universe was dominated by a perfect fluid with arbitrary equation of state and constant. And the other one that the universe was dominated by is some canonical scalar field with a constant equation of state. The canonical means that the, the sound speed of uh, fluctuations will be equal to unity. Now, if, if CS is less than one, we, I told you we expected some resonances. So you can see the resonance here clearly, some very, very sharp peaks in the induced gravitational wave spectrum. And you also see that the, the stiffer the, the equation of state, so this magenta line is one ninth, and then it increases until nine tenths. So the, the, uh, the stiffer the fluid, so somehow the sharper the, the resonance. Uh, on the other hand, if you have this canonical scalar field, you see that because the sound speed is unity, um, by momentum conservation, there cannot be any resonance. So that's why you don't see any peak here. So this effect is on top of the, the previous effect of this mid infrared and, and UV tails I was discussing before. So now please remember this, that the, the, stiffer, the stiffer the fluid, the bigger the resonance because now we are going to discuss some slightly more complicated case, which is the case that you have large oscillatory modulations in the primordial spectrum, um, something like this. 
So here you have the, the primordial spectrum in terms of weight number. And I will assume that you have order one oscillations. So you have some envelope and some oscillations on top of that. This um, could happen if you have a sharp turn in the inflationary trajectory. And if you want to know the details of the model, you should check this nice work by the people in Paris. Here, I will just assume that you have this initial condition. And then I will compute the induced gravitational wave I'm expected. So let me tell you before we look in, in detail in the, in the plot that the, the induced gravitational waves are a second, second order effect. So this means that you, you will have somehow integral over the, the scalar momentum, the internal momentum of this fluctuation square. And because it's squared and you are integrating, this will tend to average any oscillation. Um, so you, you don't expect to see many oscillations in the induced gravitational wave spectrum unless there is something more. So for example, if, the, if there is no resonance in the in this Dirac delta. So if we have um, CS square equal one, you see there are no oscillations in the induced gravitational wave spectrum. So the, the resonances are playing an important role in capturing the oscillations in the induced gravitational wave spectrum. So here I am assuming just some radiation or radiation-like universe with different um, propagation speed. And the reason why you can see the oscillations in the case of a perfect fluid is because of, of, of the existence of resonances. So if you look now at the, the equations of motion here, and you consider all these peaks as some kind of Dirac delta combs, this was first shown by Kai et al. So you put here in the source term some Dirac delta comb square. So this means you will have some sum over different uh, oscillating functions. And this oscillating function will have a frequency, which is you know, the difference in frequencies of these functions will be related to the difference in the, the separation of the peaks. So you have periodic peaks, then you will have some periodic resonances. And this is what happens here. So these resonances are crucial to, to imprint the, the, oscill the primordial oscillations in the induced gravitational wave spectrum. And with also with this uh, simpler, simpler example, you can relate the frequency of the oscillation with the initial frequency of the primordial ones. So here they call the omega lean and omega gravitational waves. And you can relate them by the sound speed of, of fluctuation. So the higher the, the sound speed, the higher the frequency. So if now if you you would hope that if you see these oscillations in the induced gravitational spectrum, you can know what was the frequency of the primordial oscillations and know the, the, the inflationary model. But this is not as straightforward because it depends uh, on the equation of state. So for example, now if I consider a stiffer equation of state, I will have a higher frequency and also higher amplitude uh, because the, this higher amplitude is because the resonance is much sharper and, gets to much larger values. But there's some interesting, interesting effect is that because it tends to smooth out these oscillations, um, you can check that in the radiation domination, the amplitude of this oscillation um, with respect to the, the envelope cannot be larger than 20% in radiation domination. But if you are considering some stiff fluid, uh, the amplitude ca can go above that maybe uh, until 40%. So if you see oscillations in the induced gravitational wave spectrum, and they are much larger than this envelope by 40%, and then it's definitely a sign of beyond standard cosmology in the sense that you have not only some large modulations of the primordial spectrum, but also some different expansion history. OK, so that's all I want to say about the, the adiabatic initial conditions and the various possibilities. I would like now to discuss some more recent work on what happens if you have initialized or curvature fluctuations. So let me, let me start by reviewing a little bit what, what is the situation. So I will be considering there is no 
initial adiabatic fluctuation. So let me take, for example, here you have energy density, um, some distribution of energy density. Um, I will take radiation to be homogeneous. And then I will consider there is some fluctuations in some matter, matter fluid. These fluctuations can be called our matter fluctuations. Or these fluctuations could also be because you have some primordial black hole um, distribution in the universe. Okay. So for example, this, if these primordial black holes are created from um, large curvature perturbations, they will be distributed randomly in space. And so they will have some inhomogeneous distribution. And when you look at it at this from some coarse grain perspective, you will kind of you can understand it as some fluctuations in, in the, the on matter fluid. So this was, was first pointed out by Papa Nicolau, Benan, and Langlois. So and from that moment on, um, the, this two, the evolution of the isoc curvature will be the same. Either you have colder matter or this primordial black hole density fluctuations. Now let me take one time step. And as time goes on, the, the relative energy density changes. So the dark matter or primordial black holes gain some relative weight with respect to radiation. And some of the iso curvature will start to be converted to small adiabatic perturbations. And these adiabatic perturbations can be the source of induced gravitational waves. So at this stage, you have some indirectly induced gravitational waves in the sense that iso curvature has sourced some, sourced some adiabatic perturbation and this adiabatic perturbation is sourcing induced gravitational waves. And from this, you can also see that the later a mode enters the horizon, the larger the, tra the transfer to curvature uh, there will be because the, this transfer is proportional to this um, relative weight of the, the energy densities. So this, this in the directly induction of gravitational waves uh, is the first possibility, and this will be the case for colder matter is curvature. But we can keep going and see what happens if the matter dominates. Uh, in the case that primordial black holes um, dominate the universe, you will have that all the iso curvature is transferred to adiabatic, and now you have a large production of, of gravitational waves. The interesting point of this um, scenario is that if these gravitational waves are induced in an early matter era that then transition suddenly to radiation domination, um, this production is greatly enhanced. This was shown by Inomata. And this is what happens with when you have primordial black hole evaporation. So this will be the second, uh, second possibility um, the gravitational wave induced by primordial black hole isocurvature. So let's, let's have a look at the first example and these gravitational waves induced by cold dark matter isocurvature. Here I would like to show you with some detail what is the evolution of the scalar mode so you can understand a bit when and the production of gravitational happens and also some interesting things. Um, here I show the transfer function for the scalar modes versus conformal time. In red, you have curvature perturbation. In blue, you have the iso curvature evolution with some constant mode subtracted. And in black, you have the, the relative velocities between uh, colder matter and radiation. Um, this plot has been um, normalized by some suppression factor. Um, so you, you have to multiply this value by some suppression factor, which is k, k, one over kp k equality, like k over k equality. And you can see, if you look at the, the blue line, this is a curvature, you see that it grows on superhorizon scales, and it may eventually reach some nonlinear um, regime, even during radiation domination. If that happens, then you will form primordial black holes. And this is discussed by Samuel and, and Misao. But in these gravitational waves, which are generated by the curvature perturbation, we mainly occur at um, horizon crossing. Okay. So uh, what I want to emphasize is that even though you may reach some nonlinear regime from primordial black holes, 
at that point, the curvature perturbation is small. And even if we are in the nonlinear regime, the production of induced gravitational waves will be not that important. So most of the induced gravitational waves are here at horizon crossing. And so perturbation expansion is fine. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want to look at the spectrum, um, so you need a large enough color matter iso curvature to have a detectable signal because because of the suppression factor. So this is clear in this plot here. Uh, here you see the amplitude of a Dirac delta a primordial spectrum of iso curvature fluctuations versus um, some peak wave number. This shows the parameter space that we could probe with um, future experiments. Um, this one is the current one. This is from CMB, from Planck. This very tight constant iso curvature. Then you have spectral distortions. And then you see pulsar timing, uh, LISA, the Snigo in blue, and Einstein telescope in green. And you can see the amplitude of ISO curvatures is, is fairly large. But at the moment, these are the only, um, this is the only way to constrain or to probe this parameter space. So it's already interesting enough. Um, we derived with um, me and Samuel and Sebastian, we derived all the analytical kernels to compute the, the spectrum. And for the direct delta, it looks like this. Here I show spectral density of a wave number. The red line is the adiabatic spectrum I showed you before of the direct delta. And the blue one is the one from the ISO curvature um, normalized to subtract the, the suppression factor. You can see they have all both the same resonances. But this, and the spectrum looks similar, but they, is, they are not exactly the same. So the, the minimum is not exactly zero and the growth to the peak is a little bit different. So although they, are look, they look similar, we, if you see everything, you may hope to, to disentangle them. Now there is some interesting, let's say future work in, uh, of this possibility. And it's related that you need a very large um, amplitude of initial isocurvature fluctuations. And if you look at the, the definition of isocurvature, of initial isocurvature, you see that the, this isocurvature cannot be um, less than minus one, otherwise you would have negative energy density. So it's bounded from below by minus one, but you want it to get to very, very large values. This means that if S is drawn from a probability distribution, this distribution has to be um, highly skewed, so it has to be um, highly non Gaussian have a very, very large tail. And we try to estimate what would be the impact of this highly skewed distribution um, with some heuristic estimates. And we found that the, the amplitude of the gravitational waves get enhanced by several orders of magnitude. And therefore, we, we could probe a larger um, portion of parameter space. Um, this enhancement, you can understand it because. Um, gravitational waves are related to the four point function of these um, scalar fluctuations. So, if you have a large tail, um, very he uh, skewed um, distribution, then you have a large uh, four point function. But this again, this, is, this needs some future work. Uh, we have to investigate a little bit more. Now, with the Last minutes I have, I'd like to discuss this second example, this gravitational waves by primordial black hole density fluctuations. Um, the main source now is not at horizon crossing, the main source of these gravitational waves, but the main source occurs at uh, evaporation. And here you see the density ratio of radiation and primordial black holes versus e fold. Um, Initially, you have radiation domination, primordial black holes dominate eventually, but they evaporate and radiation dominates. But the, as you can see here, the evaporation is in less than one quarter of an effort. So it's very, very fast evaporation. And this creates huge velocity fluctuations and a loud gravitational wave signal. Um, here I just rewrote the, the, the equations for induced gravitational waves in terms of the, the velocity. Now this will be the dominant component, um, and these are the, the, the main source of induced gravitational waves. There's also some induced gravitational waves um, generated during primordial black hole dominated era. 
Um, but it, it's a little bit suppressed um, compared to the, the, the one at evaporation or after evaporation. And if you want to know more, I invite you to check the, this paper by Papa Nicolau and Benan. Now, this loud gravitational wave signal, we can use it to test uh, this primordial black hole dominated universe. Um, here I show some constraints on the initial fraction of primordial black holes versus the mass of this initial mass of primordial black holes. And the lower bound is by requiring that you have primordial black hole domination to begin with. And the upper bound comes from requiring that you are not in conflict with uh, PBM constraints. So if our estimates are, are correct, then the, the initial fraction of primordial black hole to have a primordial black hole dominated universe can only lie within this two order of magnitude um, range. Now the spectrum from this um, primordial black hole evaporation will look like this. So you will have a very large peak at some given uh, frequency. And in addition to this signal, you might have some signal on the effective a number of effective species in the CMB if the primordial black hole have spin. So by seeing this induced gravitational wave signal and maybe the one in the, in the CMB and effective, you can test the primordial black hole um, formation mechanism. So we hope that in the future you can test this primordial black hole dominated universe with ET and, and the cyber. There's some all some. There's also some future work to be done in these respects. Um, during this primordial black hole domination, most of the primordial black hole density fluctuations uh, enter the nonlinear regime. So the fact that we use uh, linear perturbation theory might be questionable. Um, but actually, what it means is that there will be some black hole mergers and we, I don't think that the production of gravitational wave will stop since we have a um, curvature perturbation is always much more than one. So I like to think of our estimate as being some good order of magnitude estimate. If we want to investigate what happens more around primordial black hole evaporation with these large black hole density fluctuations, um, then we need some, some numerical works. Some speculative um, possibilities that maybe you have turbulences and so on, but this is definitely something that is worth um, looking into. So let me let me summarize my talk uh, very briefly. Um, I hope I showed you that and convinced you that induced gravitational waves with these primordial black holes are a unique prop of inflation, but not only inflation, but also the physics after inflation. So for example, different equation of state of the universe shows up with a mid um, IR um, broken power law. You could have different type of resonant peaks or you can constrain primordial black hole dominated universes. And you can also know a bit of inflation from this small scale primordial spectrum, these oscillations, or also if the fluctuations were isocurvature or adiabatic, and maybe if they are Gaussian or non-Gaussian. Um, so I, I'd like to finish here and have some questions if you have it. Thank you.